Listen, I want to thank you, Mike, and uh, you know all of the Team Logic uh, members or team or however you guys um, call yourselves for allowing David and I to present to you today. We're really excited to be able to work with all of you and and provide you, I think, some um, some great discounts so that you can get on with the tool, uh, use it, hopefully make a lot of money and make a lot of clients happy. Um, so I'm Mark Winter, VP Sales for Rapid Fire Tools. Uh, we are Division of Performance IT. <clears throat> Just a little bit about our company. Um, we were founded back in 1997, so we've been around a little while. Uh, we did start off actually as a managed service provider to large organizations. Um, you know, think of a general product, uh, parts company, things like that, where we did uh, network monitoring. And we ended up building our own tools and became a Microsoft uh, Gold ISV partner. Um, a little bit later, we began focusing our development on tools for the service provider channel. And that included, um, if you happen to have known about it, our Proactive Watch monitoring software, which is still available, and then our flagship products, um, which are the rapid fire tools, including Network Detective, that we're going to be talking about today. Um, let me just kind of start off and tell you that Network Detective um, is comprised of three distinct modules, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and they can be acquired separately, or you can purchase them together as a bundle to save money. Uh, it really just depends on what your business needs are um, for which modules you would choose. Uh, we've been selling Network Detective now for, I think, a little over three years. Um, there are thousands of users worldwide using the products, uh, very happy users. Uh, you know, On the website, you can take a look at uh, videos and other testimonials. Um, today, I'm joined by uh, David Hinder, um, our product specialist, as Mike said, and he's going to you know, actually do a, uh, a product demo, walk you through some of the port reports, and then um, talk about some uh, door openers, too, that you can use as a way to take the information you get from the tool and help position yourselves better um, in prospecting and uh, you know, using it for existing customers as well. So I'm certain most of you do um, assessments today. Um, and you know, I'm often asked whether or not you should charge for a network assessment. Uh, there was um, a poll recently run by a PSA vendor, and they asked if they should offer um, free network assessments. As you can see, about a third of them said, yes, uh, we offer them for free, um, while a little over two-thirds said, no, you should really charge something for your work. Uh, one of the survey respondents indicated they were doing a pretty large assessment. It was well over, 20, I think it's like $27,000 or something. Um, but that was very detailed. It included executive interviews, email surveys, um, uh, a lot of other tasks. So this would not be your standard um, you know, free kind of audit type of thing. But the point is that they said they would do a lot more, that they actually do offer free assessments, and that they would do a lot more if they had better tools um, so that they could do it more quickly. Um, you know, I've got customers all the time that tell me, you know, they sell outright assessments. So one person told me he sold it was well over ten thousand dollars, and that was primarily on you know his analysis and the detail from uh, what we call our detailed uh, report. So, you know, what you can charge, uh, I think, really is going to vary uh, depending upon the size of the organization that you're going to do the um, assessment for, and of course, the business they're in. You know, I think financial organizations. Um, you know, anybody in the healthcare field can pay and will pay a little bit more depending upon the type of assessments or audits you're doing. And of course, it's going to depend upon your market and competition. Um, so free or paid? You know, with Network Detective, as you'll see, you can really do both. Um, but the key here is you need a deliverable that doesn't really cost you a lot of time to create and also doesn't uh, necessarily give away all your work if you're doing that, uh, where they can take those details and run with it themselves. Um, what you're going to see with Network Detective is that each module has a, um, a set of reports, and there's one we call the risk report, which is really more of your executive summary. It's a perfect leave behind for um, free audits or when you're putting together a proposal that you want to attach something with. And um, you know, if you're selling an audit um, or just to have in your back pocket when you're doing your presentation, you've got a lot of the detail reports that have a ton of findings. Um, now, one thing I can tell you for certain, based on the survey, and uh, you know, David and I speak with folks all the time, um, whether or not people are charging for them, uh, whether you, they're being used for prospecting um, or ongoing customer checkups or auditing your own work, the vast majority of folks we talk to are regularly doing assessments. 
and most would do a lot more if it were quicker and a little easier to perform. So, again, in, in speaking with people and the way we see that these are used, um, you know, there's a ton of really good reasons for offering IT assessments to both prospects and customers. And these could be everything from general network and system level assessments uh, to deeper security and exchange. And, you know, the top uses seem to range from, uh, you know, using for lead generation and pre-engagement checks and onboarding to regular use at all of your clients. And I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes now to touch on each of these. So it would be no surprise that a key area of focus for people we speak with is growing their business. And they're doing that by um, looking to add customers. So how do you do that? Well, obviously marketing and lead generation. But, you know, along with, you know, really good tactics, good lists, good copy, you really do need a compelling offer uh, or, you know, a call to action. And you know, something that's going to get a prospect to raise their hand and say, yeah, okay, I'm up for a sales call. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I'd typically like to ask is, you know, have you ever Googled your competition? And I think one of the things you'll see that um, a lot of them do offer free network audits or discounted network assessments, that kind of thing. And how obvious? I mean, it's a great way to entice a prospect. You provide them a free, valuable service. And at the same time, you get to take a look at the network, see what's wrong. Um, that way you can kind of highlight those issues in your proposals, in your discussions with that prospect, and sell against it. And ultimately, if you were going to quote, uh, you know, a managed service proposal or just a contract, a, a break, fix, or block hours, or whatever it would be, you would still need to do that anyway in order to, to quote that properly. So it really is just too perfect. But I'm sure I don't have to tell you that you know, performing assessments, gathering the data, and building the reports can really be time-consuming and, of course, costly unless you've got the right tools. And sure, there are point tools out there and monitoring systems, but in my opinion, the right tools should be non-invasive, leave nothing behind, especially if the prospect has an IT person or company that they already work with, because you wouldn't want, uh, and they wouldn't want you to <clears throat> tip off the incumbent IT since they are looking around. And again, it should be automated. Um, so that way you can kind of kick off a data collection, let it run, while you have a chance to walk through the offices with the CEO or the CFO or whoever you're selling to. Learn about their business, understand um, the challenges that they have with IT, and of course build rapport with um, you know both the owners of that company and uh, the people that you're talking to. Um, and the data collection should be fast and problem free. Uh, you know, ideally finishing up in 30 to 60 minutes so it's done when you're finished with um, your sales call. And the end result really should be reports that prevent, that present or allow you to present the information in a very professional, well-organized manner. Um, fully brandable, um, your name, your client's name, et cetera. And what you're looking for here is a way to show that you know the current IT is not being handled as well as it could be. Look for poor configurations, uh, security risks. Um, and of course, as I said before, if you're offering free assessments, you really do want to leave behind that's going to give good value, make you look good, um, but doesn't give away the farm. That way, their incumbent IT or they themselves can't go fix problems that you've discovered for them. So whether or not you're using assessments as lead generation, you know, let's say you're ready to build your proposal for onboarding a new client, uh, whether that's managed services or block time. So you're really going to need to do an IT assessment because unless you're looking for trouble, you know. You can't really do that quote unless you know the tech technical makeup of their current network and systems. Um, you need to know what you're going to be supporting, how many workstations are active on the network, what time of applications are they running, uh, what's the makeup of those PCs? Are they new, old, uh, and what operating system? Is it XP that's going to you know, end of life here soon? How much RAM? Will it support upgrades to Windows 8, et cetera? Because all this is going to give you, a type of, uh, you know, an idea of the types of issues you're likely to encounter. Um, maybe what projects you can uh, suggest and how needy the organization will be. And then, of course, you've got servers, printers, um, network devices, et cetera. And Active Directory, um, there's a lot more to grasp there. Is it set up properly, well-maintained? Is it over, overly complex or perhaps it's um, way too flat? So, you know, performing a detailed network assessment really does become a necessary component of providing that quotation and then building the plan to onboard the client. And if you're doing exchange, 
um, you definitely want to include a scan of that as well. Make sure you see how well it's set up, um, the kind of the size of Exchange, number of folders, who are the heavy users, etc. And of course, if you're performing or proposing an Exchange migration, you really do need the deep level of understanding that a good tool can provide. Now, good documentation of the network, everything from the assets to user login, AD, network shares, etc., should definitely become part of the proposal as a baseline for the project, and really can become essential for justifying complex or time-consuming tasks. And of course, it's extremely relevant for project work, such as um, you know server migrations or consolidations. So you've done your lead generation, put together a proposal, onboarding, you know, the use of assessments here is, is fairly obvious. Um, you want to make sure you've got that baseline snapshot of the client's network and system configuration prior to onboarding, since you do need to know everything about that business. I mean, your, um, your help desk, your level one folks, uh, need the documentation so that they know what they're going to be supporting. You need to know, similar to what I just went through, all about the assets. Um, what they are, their age, software on the network, what's an Active Directory, et cetera. And that's true whether or not you're going to be setting up monitoring, which I'm sure you probably are. Um, as I said, it's really essential to document and communicate to your team the environment. And most of you, I think, are using a PSA ticketing system. And, you know, Mike, I'm not sure. Do you guys focus on Autotask or ConnectWise? In any case, um, you definitely want to get your information into that. And with uh, Network Detective, as you'll see in a minute, uh, you know we've got a couple of ways that you can populate information automatically from Network Detective into um, your PSA system. Um, you know, another thing, when you're performing assessments, whether at prospecting, like I said a second ago, or at existing customer sites, that'll often turn up the opportunity for new projects for you. Uh, examples here, um, you know, some of the obvious, identifying systems that are near capacity, uh, old machines nearing their end of their life, um, operating systems uh, nearing the end of the life, or maybe even ex-employees with logins still active. A and case in point, um, you know, it's been a little while, but I, used, I spoke with um, someone using Network Detective, and they ran a report against a large network, and it was a school system. Uh, and they found over 700 old student accounts with logins still active. That was a huge security risk. Uh, you know, these people could log in at any time if they only knew that their um, credentials were still active. And this was something the onsite IT was supposed to have handled. And of course, that led to a nice project for them, as well as ongoing work. Uh, you know, other things, identify in inconsistent security policies across the network, or find holes in security practices that need to be put in place. And David's going to show you all this, too. Um, uh, and the obvious, exchange migrations. You know, whether to exchange 2010, 2013, or the cloud, it's a great opportunity for you. And having the documentation of the current environment will really help you scope the project and give you the doc that you need on, you know, mailbox size, distribution lists, mobile device use, and more. Uh, you know, the idea there, you don't necessarily want to just perform your migration and copy exactly what's there. Have the information, analyze it yourself, review it with the um, stakeholders in the client organization, because it may be that you don't need all the distribution lists, or members of distribution lists need to be changed. Um, perhaps delegated access is incorrect, and these are all things that you can create, that you can um, fix in the process of doing your migration, and then run it afterwards, whether it's an exchange migration or any other project. Do your assessment afterwards so that you can do a before and after. Show them the results, a great way to help you get paid faster too. So finally, um, you really should be providing a regular health checkup for all of your customers. And make this part of your quarterly business reviews or technology business reviews or whatever you call them. Um, you know, I'm sure you're doing some of that today, uh, but using a tool like Network Detective will really add value to the client relationship. And it's something you can often charge extra for. Um, you know, from a general perspective, Make sure that you're not supporting systems that might have been added without your knowledge, you know, whether that's uh, BOID or people just installing on the network. Um, and, you know, it may be that you're not even getting paid to support these. Uh, you can uncover issues that need fixing and identify and document areas where you need to sell new projects like I just talked about. Um, if you're not already doing so, consider adding a security assessment. Um, I think this is something you can definitely charge more for, and folks using Network Detective are doing this a lot. Um, you know, I'm sure I don't need to convince you that viruses, spyware, malware, 
you know, worms, all that ver are very real threats to your client's network and business. And even, you know, the best antivirus and malware, it's not perfect 100% of the time. And when there's a problem, a single user can be down for hours. And of course, if it spreads through the network, you know, it's even worse. Um, so performing security health checks can really help your clients, you know, protect their assets, guard against downtime, help them sleep better at night. And the key here is regular. So the idea with sort of a managed security service would be to sell a quarterly, con you know, an annual contract where you'd quarterly come in, run a security scan, go through the reports, and do any corrections that need to be done. And so this is done on a regular basis, and it's something that people are charging for. Smaller environments, one ninety nine a quarter. A little bit larger, two forty nine, two ninety nine. Whatever the market will bear for you. Um, very quickly, that's great recurring revenue, and if, as long as you've got the right tools um, that don't require security expertise, this can be a very profitable add-on and also help make your customers more sticky. So a lot of reasons you should be running IT assessments, um, both in building your business and retaining clients, but you really do have to have the right tools. So, and um, that way it doesn't require expensive, time-consuming data collection and report generation. And also, like I said, you won't need to hire expensive or use expensive personnel like security experts to perform this kind of work. And that's where a network detective comes in. So let me just kind of give you a brief description of how easy it is to perform a network assessment with network detective. First off, it's specifically designed that you can run a data collector on your prospect or client network without installing software. And that's really important. Um, because nothing's installed, it's completely non-invasive. There's no registry changes. doesn't go into add-remove programs. Critical when you're prospecting. That way there's no trace, no footprint that you were there. It works very quickly. Scans can run in as little as 20 to 30 minutes for smaller networks. Um, it gathers the data, produces a zip file, and you bring that back to your office, bring it into the network detective tool, and that's where you can say, set up your branding, save your defaults, um, but add, you know, your logo, client logo, their information, and, you know, one button then generates the reports. It's very easy to do. I mean, I talk to, you know, at least somewhat technically proficient salespeople all the time who go on-site by themselves without, you know, an SE. They're able to run the data collector during their introductory meeting with a client. You know, it gathers the data while they, you know, can conduct their interview, build rapport, and do their job, which is selling and saves you a lot of money, therefore, because you're not having to spend, you know, senior level engineering time. You know, let's say it's uh, hour travel, an hour of um, on-site discovery work, and now the senior's on the hook for building the report, which could be another two or three hours. So this could save you a ton of time, a ton of money, and let you do more of these um, in that same period of time without stressing your resources. So this is important. I'm often asked, why would I need a tool like Network Detective when I've got Kaseya or Enable or some other monitoring system? So sure, you can go install a bunch of licenses or stick a probe out there for a week or two. Um, but what does that cost you in terms of the license costs? Um, and of course, your time and effort to you know install agents. And what if you don't win the account? You've got to then go back in and pull those things out. And what happens if when in a prospecting situation something goes wrong? Um, seriously, if you go in, you install agents or probes on the network, and something does happen later that day or during the week, who are they going to blame? You're the last ones in there. Think they're going to blame themselves or their current IT provider? No. They're going to point the finger at you. Either you're not going to get the deal, or you're going to have to maybe spend some free time fixing something that's a problem you didn't even create. Like I said, Network Detective is completely non-invasive. You run the data collector program without installing anything. Bring the data file back where you build the reports. Um, on the other hand, though, Network Detective is not going to get you, you know, metrics and statistics on performance-based things, you know, like CPU and um, memory use. Um, your monitoring system, especially the agent-based systems like Kaseya or Operative Watch, can be running for weeks or longer, and those will give you that detailed performance reports. But one, that's normally not appropriate for new prospects, and two, very, I, I'm not really spoken with a lot of people who needed ongoing metrics to build a proposal and look for issues on the network. Um, so on the other hand, though, there's still really good reason to run Network Detective in your existing client base where you do have monitoring installed. And why is that? 
That's typically because monitoring programs don't perform any real ongoing analysis or reporting on, let's say, Active Directory, nor do they perform external vulnerability scans looking for, you know, ways people can come in from the outside and attack a network, or regularly look for open ports inside the network on an IP scan, nor do they provide professional documentation on things like network shares, security policies, and none that I'm aware of do a deep dive into Exchange. So using Network Detective regularly will do all that for you, and with the change report that you get, you can quickly identify systems you might not be charging for in your managed services. So I hope I've given you a couple of things to think about. Uh, you know, why IT assessments really should be a key component of, um, you know, everything from prospecting and onboarding clients to your regular health checks and how you might use them regularly in your practice. So at this point, um, let me quit talking um, and let me turn this over to David. He's going to go into more detail, demonstrate Network Detective for you, go over some of the sample reports, um, and show you what we call some door openers. Um, as a reminder, we do have some special pricing for uh, Team Logic IT, and um, I'm really looking forward to showing that to you. So stick around. David? I'm David Hinder, Product Specialist with Rapid Fire Tools, uh, which has Network Detective, which is, of course, going to be today's focus. Um, so with that in mind, let's see if I can advance. Okay, perfect. So. Network Detective is extremely simple, easy to use. Again, you don't need to send a senior technician out, uh, a sales associate or a junior tech with either a set of instructions or kind of a basic technical understanding can um, run this just fine. Um, so again, you're not sending that high billable resource. You're sending uh, somebody that, um, generally speaking, is going to cost you a little less and get you the same results. So back at your office, you're going to launch the Network Detective application. You're going to initiate an external vulnerability scan uh, I'll walk you through each of these more visually, uh, but just to kind of show you the flow. Um, you'll do that at your office, and then you head to the customer site. You're going to run the network-wide data capture from their domain controller as a domain admin. Uh, it runs off of a thumb drive, so you're not having to install anything. With an existing customer, you can obviously remote in, download and run it, or uh, push it via your RMM and you know have it run that way. It's just a lot of different ways you can run it, but for prospecting, you know, right off the thumb drive, it's a wizard. It's going to walk you through each step, so you don't really have to um, do a whole lot of command line arguments or finagling with it. It's just pretty straightforward. Um, while that's running, there's a couple other pieces of data collection you may want to do. So we have a local data capture. Uh, that's kind of an as-needed. So if there were some machines that were firewalled off or have security policies that's blocking a collection, uh, you'll know because our tool will let you know from the um, protocol availability scan who's fully available, partially available, or unavailable. Outside of that, we recommend doing a security capture on a handful of machines. We recommend three to five, uh, just kind of a random sampling. That's going to test some things we can only get from the inside of a machine, uh, outbound system egress, content accessibility, things like that. We also have an exchange data collector. You can run it on the same machine. If it's an SBS, it would just be two separate applications. Um, there's no problem with that. If they have Exchange on a different server, you can run the Exchange data collector off of that server separately. Uh, if they're Office 365, you could even run it from your own office. Um, just any outbound internet connection would work for the uh, Exchange capture of their Office 365. So you're doing this additional capture, and that's going to be concurrent with step two. So while that's happening all automated, um, two or three minutes of its actually user input with the majority of it being automated. So the manual data collection you're doing in step three is going to kind of give you um, extra information that you can use to quote projects, make sure you're not overlooking uh, opportunities. And part D on number three um, is actually really critical to that. It's called Inform. So that's going to get you a lot of um, interview, survey, inspection sort of data, things that we can't automate. So cable uh, management, are their cables labeled? Do they have things sitting on the floor? Or is everything put in a rack how it should be? Uh, key card access, bring your own device policy, things like that. And again, the document's automatically generated, so you're getting face time with the customers in step three, uh, rather than just sitting in the server room waiting for the capture to finish. Um, once all the data capture has finished, though, um, you're back off to your office. Uh, you're just going to import the data, um, build and brand your reports, pretty much. It's a very simple, straightforward process. And um, just to give you a little information on the reports themselves, they're direct from you to your customer. There's zero mention of us. 
It's going to be your header, your logo. We have a customization wizard that will give you different kind of styles and themes and templates, uh, different images, and I'll, I'll walk you through that part as well. Um, again, because these are Word, Excel, and Visio documents that are produced, uh, not PDFs, you can change them. Uh, if there's something you want to add in uh, or something you want to remove, feel free to do so. If you want to apply your own theme or template, absolutely possible as well. And there's some really cool things you can do with Excel and Visio because, you know, in Excel, search, sort, filter, make your own charts and graphs, things to that effect. In the Visio output, you could make your own network map or network topology if you wanted to. Um, so our Visio output is more of a, a visual depiction of the assets. Uh, it's not going to be, you know, John's PC is connected into this switch, is connected into that device, is connected into um, the hip bone. Uh, but <laughs> so on the Visio side, um, you're able to take that output and you can make a custom map or topology if you wanted to. Um, just cool things you can do with um, both the Excel and the Visio. So without further ado, uh, I'm actually going to do a live demonstration, uh, walk you through everything you saw on that um, kind of a flow process chart. Uh, and again, we're going to start in the Network Detective app to do the external scan, and then we're going to do the uh, data collection, and then we're going to generate some reports and kind of walk you through the different options. So um, this right here is the Network Detective application. This is going to be installed on your desktop, laptop, workstation. Uh, I've heard of people putting it on a Citrix server, so it's portable. Uh, just however you feel like putting it, uh, that's completely possible. Uh, it's a .NET app, um, so you would have to run it in Windows or Parallels if you're on a Mac. Um, but, you know, again, any engineers, any technicians can have this on their machine. We don't charge um, for the application itself. We, um, you know, the service is really creating the reports. So inside of here, you'll notice a few different sections, and I'll kind of walk you through them. So we have scans. This is where, once you import something, it'll live in your library. Now, all of your technicians in your company can, again, have access to the tool, but as a baseline, things are stored in the app data directory on the local computer. If you wanted to share a kind of a set of folders so everybody has the same scans, everybody sees the same reports, things to that effect, you can do that from change data directory. It's pretty simple um, to do, and if everybody's mapped to the same location, everybody will see the same files. But again, just to establish kind of a baseline, um, your um, you're looking at having everything on your local computer in the app data, but it, it is easy to change. So you have your scans. We have Inform. Uh, you may notice a little beta icon as we release new things. We obviously vet them, but um, sometimes we have cool things that we want to release and um, you know get kind of user feedback before putting the final seal of approval. We'll talk about that in a moment. Reports. So once you've actually generated uh, reports, they'll live in your reports directory. Uh, we have manage users. Again, you can have any number of users in your company that can each have their own sign into the tool. Um, billing information, pretty straightforward. Um, and then we have preferences. Let me go to scans before preferences, though. So in preferences, uh, this is where you can kind of set your defaults. So the name of your company, uh, the default footer you would like on all of your reports, your disclaimer. This is where you can kind of see what our customization is. So you add your cover image and your header logo. Um, you specify each of those images, and it's going to kind of show you on this area to the right where it's going to be on your reports. We have different themes, so ranging from kind of a minimalist basic theme uh, to a classic theme, which is just going to be an image with the name of the report, who it's for, who it's from, and then some more um, contemporary, you know, more modern sorts of themes. Um, so you pick how you'd like your reports to be generated. Uh, we have a preset set of um, colors, and again, it's kind of going to be the top colors, all the network assessment reports, the middle is all the security, and the bottom is all the exchange. But we'll say that maybe your company's logo um, you know, has a lot of blues in it, or maybe it has a lot of greens in it, or you want to use some different colors. You can, of course, customize this to where you know, all your network reports are, are fuchsia, and uh, security are pink, and you know, exchange are you know, like a light blue. So that's fully flexible, um, and again, it's going to create a more customized sort of a feel to the reports to where they're really going to match your company's um, logo and branding. Now outside of that, all of the network reports are going to share the same color, security the same color, and exchange the same color, but they also share the same image on the front of them. Um, you can upload a custom image. This may be um, your client's logo. Maybe it's a picture of their building. Maybe you're trying to tailor the reports a little more personal towards them. Um, it could just be kind of a generic network or generic security. 
Uh, maybe it's a particular vertical. Maybe you're going um, for a legal sort of a setup because they're uh, a medical office, and you really want to make the reports, again, kind of tailored to what they're, um, they're going for. Uh, but again, these are just going to kind of be your defaults, and you can, of course, change these on the fly. So if you go to generate a set of reports for a customer and they're a law firm, you can, at the time of run, change it to a law theme, and that won't mess with your defaults. But these are going to be your account defaults, and all of your technicians, uh, all of your salespeople, anybody producing reports are going to share the same look and feel so you get a nice standard uh, inside of your company. So that's kind of what you can do inside of the Network Detective application itself. Um, of course, as I mentioned, you're going to start by initiating your external scan. So you give it a label. Um, so you could call it, you know, Prospect Acme Corp, um, you know, Q1 2013. Uh, you just give it a label. And again, this is going to live in your library. So you're going to want to make sure it's not X or, you know, company. You know, it, it's not something that's... Um, it is freeform, and you're free to kind of name these however you'd like, um, but uh, make it something meaningful. So you key in their IP address. It will start the scan uh, just to set expectations. Uh, you may notice that it says you can enter up to 16 addresses. Um, this is truly unlimited use, so you're free to schedule as many external scans as you'd like. Uh, but we found that 16 is a happy medium. Um, where people are going to get their jobs completed in a reasonable amount of time because, you know, not to uh, talk ill of people, but sometimes people, rather than actually doing research and figuring out what the IP block is, they'll just say, well, I know this one IP, so I'll scan a 256 block uh, just to make sure we get them all. Um, so this is kind of our way of making sure that the system continues running smoothly for everyone. So you queue up the scan just using the Network Detective application. It's not running from the tool itself. It's running from our servers out in the cloud. So this is just talking to our servers and telling it what it needs to do. So this will run, and uh, it will send you an email when it's complete by default. You can change that behavior if you don't want to get an email. But we recommend, because the external scan does take a good bit of time, doing this either the day before, the morning of, or, you know, generally speaking, not waiting till the last minute. Because if you do the scan of a customer site and you promise them a meeting on Wednesday, you probably shouldn't start the scan Wednesday morning. You should start it, you know, back on Monday just to make sure you have all your assets in a row. Um, so you start the external scan from here. You can also download the newest data collector. It's this link on the top. A couple other things we'll cover once we get the um, report data back in the tool. So oh, one more thing real quick. So inform. So before you leave for a customer site, you should have your inform documents ready. So I've talked to a few people, um, and essentially what they're doing with the tool is we have templates, uh, and these are again going to be included with the product. We have a network assessment, but we do uh, plan to expand that in the future to have a couple other templates possibly. These are going to be your sets of questions. So you have your categories and your topics. You can modify this template if you'd like. You can clone it and create your own. You can start from a blank template if you already have an established set of questions. But this is, in general, going to be all the information that your technician or salesperson should collect while they're at the site. So for example, um, what's the temperature and humidity in the server room? Do they have climate control? Um, just things that we can't automate as far as the capture, but definitely important information as it could be a, a potential service or project that you could remediate. Um, you're welcome to expand these again, but the instructions are internal use, so they're going to appear on the um, interview form. Uh, but in the response and SWOT analysis that are generated afterwards, they're obviously excluded, and it's just the notes. So there's two things you can do. So once you have the template, you're going to create an interview for a customer. So this would be you know, my prospect, uh, Q1 2013. You give it a date. Add it to your library. Now, I've heard of some people that are literally just, say, a terminal service or Citrix, uh, or maybe they have their laptop at the customer site. They're entering the notes in directly. So rather than needing to transpose later, um, you know, taking a paper printout that they're writing on with a clipboard and then bringing the information back in, they're just using this to conduct the interview. They're going through and they're asking the questions, and they're coming back with the information and they're typing it in here. Um, another thing you can do is if you'd like, you can generate a blank interview template, and this will actually create a document that you can fill out while you're at the customer site. 
So food for thought, you know, if you feel like bringing a laptop or computer with you and running directly from the site interview builder, you can do that. If not, clipboard and piece of paper, fill it out, come back and type it in afterwards. So now we'll say we're off to the customer site. We've already prepped our thumb drives. Um, I recommend taking two thumb drives with you, both with the newest data collector on it. And you're headed to the customer site. So you're going to want to be on their domain controller as a domain administrator. Now, if there's no domain, don't worry. We do support workgroups. Uh, there's an extra step in there, which I'll talk about. Uh, but you should run from the domain controller. Um, you don't have to have physical access. You can remote into it. You don't even have to have the password. They can type it in for you, and it will just piggyback on the current user. So you don't have to have the keys to the city, but you do need to be running it from town hall, for lack of a better analogy. Um, so you're running this data collector. Again, it's going to run in memory. No installation, no change, and you pick your options. So from the domain controller, you should run all three options, network, local, and security. We're going to hit next. Again, as I mentioned, it's going to piggyback on the current credentials. If there was a forest or if you had a higher level of credentials, you could specify them from here. Uh, or you could, again, say there's no domain controller if it's a work group, in which case it's only going to kind of grab the uh, topical information and you need to kind of fill in the blanks of the local capture. But we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so I'm going to hit next. This is going to use the login credentials to um, gather the domain OU listings, and then we'll be able to kind of uh, narrow down our scope. So if this is a very large company you were doing an assessment for, they may have multiple sites. Uh, maybe they have a Philadelphia office and a UK office, or uh, maybe they have an office in Toronto and another office in um, you know, Des Moines, Iowa. So you're able to, um, assuming they're broken down into logical OUs, you can specify which OUs and which groups inside of the tree structure you'd like to capture the data on. Um, not every organization is going to be set up that way. Uh, but as an example, again, this is our domain. Um, you can expand trees and just pick what you would like. Uh, you can also say gather for all domains. So you know, even in a larger company where they have multiple sites, the nice thing about this is you can do a central capture. So if they have a site-to-site -site VPN or an MPLS connection, you can certainly do a central capture from their headquarters, and it will talk to all the ch child and satellite offices, and it will pull in all that info. Now, of course, if um, they have strange routing policies or they're blocking queries between uh, the different subnets, you know, you may find you're getting less than full information, um, but it's, again, something that if everything's configured properly, you should be able to get everything from every site from a central capture. Another thing we look for is we do who is an MX um, to kind of determine domain ownership and renewal information. So inside of here, you just key in their domain. So, you know, mycustomersdomain.com. Um, so it'll determine kind of where the mail's flowing to, if they have spam filtering before it hits their mail serve, um, you know, when their um, domain's up for renewal, things like that. IP ranges, these are going to be pulled from the NIC card by default. So in the case where they have multiple NICs, um, they should both be reflected here. If they have multiple subnets, again, they're reflected here. This is something that you're able to further pare down. So just like we could specify which OUs we wanted to collect information from or just say collect for all, uh, this is the same sort of a thing. So if I only wanted to capture for the .7, um, you know, I can certainly change that. Um, if I want to you know, do a second one, um, you know, I can do that in here too. It's very easy to add in, and um, you know, of course, the the more you're scanning, the longer the scan will take. Uh, but it's still a very simple, straightforward process that you know doesn't really require a lot of technical know-how. Since for most clients you go to, you'll just be pushing next a whole lot. SNMP information is pulling public by default. Um, it's just a, a get so or a read, so you're not actually modifying anything. Uh, MBSA, this is one of the technologies we hook into. Just to be absolutely clear, while Network Detective is 100% portable and we don't install anything or make changes, if you choose to run with MBSA, MBSA is an installed app. A lot of servers out there have it since it is a very common tool. In fact, it's a free tool provided by Microsoft. Uh, this is something that we hook into to give us a little bit more information. So this is giving us patching information on the machines, which is you know a pretty big thing. And it's also giving us the local system password strength. It's not telling us what the password is on the local machine, but it'll tell us if it's blank or set to never expire or if it's a weak password by, um, you know, for example, not requiring multi-case or not requiring a number and letters, uh, alphanumeric. 
Um, so this is an option you can turn on, and it will increase the scan time a little bit since it is capturing more data. Uh, but the benefit is, of course, you're getting more data. Another thing we do is the user control test. So if you remember, we recommend running the security capture on three to five machines. Uh, this is one of them. So this will generate a security capture for this box, which in this case is DC01. Um, it's going to test outbound access to different categories of websites. Uh, it's just returning the headers. It's not actually visiting them. So you don't have to worry about you know, bad websites popping up on your, uh, your customers' computers. Uh, but it will um, test to see if it can return headers on those. So last but not least, if you're running it at a prospect network and you're running it off of the thumb drive, output back to the thumb drive. So you change where it's going to. Uh, by default, it's going to try and output to the desktop of the user that's currently signed in. Uh, we recommend, of course, outputting back to the thumb drive um, since that way you're not making any file system changes. But if it's a current customer, output to wherever you'd like. One more thing, we do a protocol availability scan. So as I mentioned, we're going to test which machines are fully available, which are partially available, and which are unavailable. So this is going to take a few moments. Uh, it's going to check across the OUs I have specified and the IP range I have paired down to. And it's going to tell me which machines are fully available, which are partially available, and which are unavailable. Um, it does take a little bit to run, but it's well worth the time. Um, if you let that complete, it'll kind of give you an itemized list. So while you're doing your network-wide collection, you know which machines you might want to do a local capture on to kind of fill in the blanks. Again, a firewall or security policy would be what would restrict the information. And if you're on the machine itself, you can do a local capture. And it's very quick. It's about four or five seconds. There's still no install, but it does require that manual touch. So we would start the scan, and we're done. So this is going to take right around 30 minutes for a five-server, 50-workstation network to actually do this capture. While this is going on, I would concurrently run the Exchange Data Collector if they have an Exchange server. If not, I could do Office 365 later. Uh, I would do my inform collection. So I'm not spending all my time in the server room. I'm getting in front of users. I'm asking them questions. Hey, you know, do you bring your own laptop to work? Do you synchronize your personal phone? Um, you know, I'm checking things, uh, temperature in the server room. I'm looking for key card access, trying to figure out who has key cards to it. You know, I'm just generally documenting things that could be projects or potential opportunities. So once I've finished the capture, I'm ready to head back to my office with all my data and start building some reports. So back in the Network Detective application, you'll simply go to Scans, and then you'll import the scan. You'll hit Browse, and you'll go to where your data is. So in this case, it would be on your thumb drive. In my case, I've got it sitting on my computer. So we have a lot of different files for a lot of different things. We have computer files for machines giving us less than full info. We have our network file, which is the big capture. Security files, the SDFs, those are going to be the three to five local captures with the security option. WDF for wireless, so if any of the local captures also had a wireless card, we're getting wireless info. Um, but in general, you're just grabbing all the files. Pretty straightforward. We choose how we want to name it, again, because we don't force any naming convention. Um, this is something that it's freeform. So you choose what makes sense. We do allow folders for organization, but you may want to put in something logical to you. So, you know, prospect, my customer, you know, Q1 2013. It's then going to create as a new archive, but because I had some computer captures, the CDF files, the machine is giving me less than full info, I'm going to get this prompt. So just like a uh, medical office or doctor's office, the, the Hippocratic Oath, uh, we take a uh, first do no further harm sort of an approach. So by default, you'll notice merge into domain is set to exclude. Now obviously we did a local capture on these machines, and this is going to be the better of the two info, but we want to give you that choice before just kind of forcing it. So generally what you would do is you would right click and select all, and then you'd right click and join all of these to that domain. Now this is going to be kind of an overwrite of that information. So we grabbed information network-wide for jamie-pc, and we're supplementing it, or replacing it rather, with this local captures information. So we're getting a better capture because we did it in person rather than remote. Um, and again, if a firewall or security policy is blocking it, um, you know, you're going to get a ton of information versus no information. Now, in the case of a Windows Home Premium box where it's not joined to the domain, you would say custom. And custom, if you notice, is defaulted to workgroup. So in your reports, you would see which machines are part of the domain and which are not part of the domain but are part of a workgroup. So you would just merge this in, and then you'll have an archive. 
So it's going to let us know that we now have an archive. And uh, now that that archive is created, we can do a few things with it. So of course, in the future, we'll be able to use this as a point of comparison. So we'll say that quarter two rolls around, and I do another capture on my prospect, which is now a customer site. And I'm looking to generate a differencing report, because we do have change reporting. Um, if I pick a change report, it'll say, hey, which archive do you want to compare this against? In which case, I'd point it at the quarter one um, set of reports. Now, two other things I can do with it. I can export to Autotask and ConnectWise. So just to show you, I'll pick it and push export to Autotask. Now, what it'll do is I pick my Autotask connection. I pick what account I want it to go to. I pick how I want things to be mapped. And then I pick the items. Pretty straightforward. So for example, I have um, an Autotask sign-in I'm using now. And ConnectWise is exactly the same. Um, I would say I want to export to prospect customer you know, here. I would create that in Autotask first, of course, because this is going to return a list of all the accounts. I would then pick that account. Uh, I would say I want to map computers as workstations, servers as you know, small business server, printers as printer, non-AD devices as equipment. I pick all of the mappings, and then I pick the items. So we can pick active, inactive, all, or none. Uh, if you pick active, it's going to be items that have registered with the domain within the last 30 days or were part of the IP scan as active. Um, so generally, we would recommend you pick active. Um, now outside of that, we can create new config items and update existing ones with the same title. It's important to note that if your RMM is already creating servers inside of Autotask and updating servers with data, you probably don't want to pick servers from this list on the right because you would get a duplicate entry. But for your time and materials customers, your break fix people, maybe you have customers that you monitor servers, but you don't monitor workstations. This is a great way to get all those assets into your ticketing system. That way you can create tickets against them. Or um, maybe they're having issues. Maybe you get a trouble ticket saying you know, DC01 is unreachable, but you don't know the IP address for it or how to remote in. You'll, of course, have all this information created in Autotask. And, You'll have better info, or, or ConnectWise, for that matter. Um, the other thing is, if you have exchange data, you can also export your contacts, which is pretty neat for onboarding. Uh, of course, the primary focus of Network Detective is creating some fantastic reports. So generate a report is last, but certainly not least, what we can do. So you pick the um, item from scans, and you hit Generate a Report. Then you pick which reports you want. So there are a lot of different reports we have. Uh, again, these SWOT analysis are um, and interview response are in beta because they're part of Inform. Uh, but we have security assessments and exchange assessments in addition to network. You just kind of pick what reports you'd like to have created. And then once you pick these things, you'll notice some things at the bottom are showing up in red or possibly in bold. Um, so what this is going to do is if it's in red, it's absolutely needed for one of the reports that I'm specifying. If it's in bold, it means it's an option. So with the bold ones, I could potentially skip that. So I don't need to provide an external scan in this case. Um, but I do need to provide these other ones. So you know, it's just going to kind of let you know what you need. So in this case, if I uncheck these two informs, I no longer need interview data. But as far as the other things, I can pick my external scan. Again, this one's still in progress that I just started. Uh, so I'll pick an older one. Now I've got it. Interview, you know, I could do the same sort of a thing where I pick my interview or um, previous scan. If I'm doing a change report, you know, I want to compare it against this one right here. Um, so you pick the things you want, then you hit next, and then it's going to ask you um, for the customer's name. So once you give it the customer's name, it'll be able to be put on every report in addition to the default branding. You're also able to choose your specific options. So Again, you set your company's defaults, but you can also change them here so that at runtime, uh, maybe it's a medical office and I don't want to use my defaults. So, you know, my customer's name here, and it's pulling everything else from my defaults. So, you know, I could change the colors at time of run. I could change the cover image if I really want to. You know, it's a law office. I hit generate, and it's going to build all the reports. Now, something about our technology that's really cool and important to note is this is all client side. So we authenticate who you are when you sign in, so we know what you have rights to run. 
Uh, we also do another authentication when you actually go to generate the reports just to make sure nothing's changed. But um, you know, it's creating all these reports locally. Now, the downside to that is for a demo, it doesn't make for a very compelling demo because my machine would be tied up for a few minutes while it's creating reports. Uh, obviously, for the sake of a, a demonstration, though, I've generated these out in advance, uh, which I will show you now. So we have, again, three modules, network assessment, security assessment, and exchange assessment. We also have Inform, which is in beta, but if you have any one of our modules or more, you get access to Inform. So to take you through, there are two main types of reports we have. Um, so we have some that are designed more for the business owner. These are our risk reports. So again, these are all going to be your header, logo, et cetera, from you to your customer. It's going to list out the discovery tasks, a risk score, a plain English summary of all the problems found on the network. And you know, there are a lot of great things in here that um, you know you can show to somebody that kind of establish that fear, uh, uncertainty, and doubt. So uh, could be the network is mismanaged. You know, you have old user accounts, you have old computers. Um, you know, you have machines that are going into extended support. Uh, this one down here, so uh, Windows XP, for example. Um, you know, maybe there are an actual risk. Um, you know, password strengths, uh, old user accounts, uh, insecure listening ports, critical patches missing, missing end, uh, endpoint security on the machines, external vulnerabilities. You know, it's just going to depend on how you really want to frame this sort of a report. But typically, when you go to a prospect, you'll have almost an encyclopedia of reports, for, for lack of a better term. This is the one you're really going to focus on, and the other ones are kind of supporting data to say, you know, this is how, um, you know, this is all the information we've gathered, and this is what we're using to substantiate our claims or show you kind of where your network is. Now, it's not just textual. Uh, we also have charts and graphs and kind of different ways you can communicate your findings, uh, show where you can be of value show where the current IT is not really providing the best job. Uh, it's just going to, again, depend a lot on your approach. And this is all automatically created in this exact format. Uh, no massaging required whatsoever. But since it's a Word document, you can, of course, change this around if you really want to. But you know, it's going to be the same great fixed format, consistent format. Uh, it's kind of crucial to, to list. So no matter if you run this with a uh, junior tech or a senior tech, if you run it today or you run it in six months, it's going to be the same format, and your customers are going to see that kind of polish uh, that comes with having consistency. So we also have full reports. These are going to be more for your technicians. These are the supporting details. They're broken down very well via table of contents, and these are live links. So if you hold down Control, you can jump to the different sections to kind of navigate a little easier. Uh, inside of these reports themselves, you're going to have that same discovery tasks. Then we go into an asset summary where it's going to be head counts of all your different devices. And then we just kind of get right into the information. So for each domain, you'll see a separate um, main section, so three, four, five, six. It'll keep going until you're out of domains that you scanned. But in this case, we're looking for domain controllers, um, FISMO roles, organizational units, group policy objects, user accounts, probably more information than they've ever seen on their network, to be honest. It's instant credibility for a prospect, for an existing client, a lot of different project opportunities, and ways you can make sure you're kind of managing their network properly in here as well. If we ever detect a problem, we highlight things in red. So if it's in red and the user table hasn't logged in within the last 30 days. Security groups may be something that you come to administrators and find everybody's an administrator. That's actually kind of what this environment looks like. Um, in computers, you may notice a lot of machines that haven't logged into the domain recently. You'll see a lot of things in red. Uh, not necessarily a security risk, just kind of lack of maintenance and process of the existing provider. We highlight duplicate DNS in red as well. So if you notice a couple machines have the same DNS, maybe things aren't configured uh, as optimally as they could be. Non-active directory devices, so switches, routers, IP phones, uh, Linux boxes, things like that will appear in here. Uh, this is where you'll see the IP address, the host name, any ports it's listening on, and then we do SNMP information. We also try and tell that in to tell you what's running on those ports if we can. Um, so in general, you'd be able to identify uh, a Red Hat box they have on their network, uh, a Cisco uh, device. So this is probably a, a switch or a router. Um, in general, it's just a, a great, easy discovery, and because it's so well laid out, you can go to, for example, the patching section, and if you notice a lot of red, 
immediately you know they have a patching problem. You go to the user section, a lot of red, immediately you know they're not managed properly as far as their user accounts or policies. So servers, uh, we identify SQL servers. Um, we'll pull information on the version, number of databases, active jobs, web servers. This section is kind of one to look out for. Um, a lot of devices are running things on uh, port 80 or 443 because um, they are typically running a website. You know, a printer, uh, for example, for example, could be running a, a, a web server for you to configure from, and, and it is a web server, although it's not, um, you know, a web server in the traditional sense. So, may may find a couple things on there that you know may or may not need to be turned off. Uh, time servers, Exchange servers. Uh, and this is just kind of the topical information on Exchange. Um, of course, we have an Exchange 07 module that gives you way more than just, you know, two machines running Exchange 07. Uh, DHCP servers, and then Hyper-V servers. So to kind of set the record on virtualization, um, most virtual machines will show up in the computer section uh, as a real computer. Uh, the goal of any virtual machine is to try and be indistinguishable from a physical machine as far as how it runs, what it does, um, and, you know, they do a good job at it. Hyper-V specifically, though, because it's a Microsoft solution, they do have a way for us to query a box, and it responds back saying, yes, I'm a VM, this is my host. Um, so y while we will turn up ESX or Hyper-V or other things on the network, um, it's not going to be quite like this. Uh, it would be in the computer section where you saw all the other computers. So we'll still get full info on the machine, you just won't know it's a VM necessarily. Uh, that may be something you have to deduce from the OU that it's in. Printers, uh, we're going to list whether they're connected from Active Directory, from WMI, or a network printer. Uh, in a network printer, we'll also return any alerts. Sometimes you see some crazy ones in here, like low on blue toner or you know, sleep written 12 times. Uh, it's just what they're returning on SNMP. Network shares, so we're going to list the machine and then the UNC shares on that particular device. Um, on our security module, we enumerate who has access to which file share and at what level. Uh, I'll show that in a minute. Uh, but you can just kind of see from this that there's a lot of information you get from our tool. Uh, installed applications, that goes on for a while. Just kind of jump around. Patching summary, we're going to look by role. So, you know, are there SQL patches missing on a machine that has a SQL server role? Uh, and we're only really dinging them for critical things. So. You can see this right here, it's a service packer update roll-up, um, security updates. Um, it's really only security updates critical and server pack uh, that we're, service pack that we're, we're really um, knocking points off for. Endpoint security and backup. So this may be something where you see a lot of um, different antivirus in use across the network. Maybe there's no antivirus, no standardization. Great projects come from that. Um, listening ports. So we're going to look at the most common listening ports just to kind of set the expectations. Internally, it's not a full 65K, uh, but we are looking at the most common ports and telling you what's running on those. Externally, we do a full 65K. That's why I uh, differentiate. Externally, we're doing a um, NDT speed test, uh, information on who is an MX, again, for domain ownership renewal, um, where the mail's flowing to, uh, external vulnerability summary, and then um, detailed analysis. So this is kind of a dump of the data. A lot of people get this from their current tool and they wanted something similar, so um, ask and thou shalt receive. Change reporting, uh, site diagram. Again, this is more of an AD diagram. It's a visual depiction of their assets. So on a domain basis, you'll see all the servers, workstations, and printers, and then the individual operating system inside. So these are going to be your workstations that are Windows 7 Enterprise. These are your Windows 7 Ultimate. Uh, and so on and so forth. And this is Word and Visio. So if you wanted to make a true network map or network topology, the Visio assets are pre-created, so you can just kind of link it all together, saving a lot of time and, of course, money, but um, not pre-done for you, just to set expectations. Uh, asset details are per PC view, just to show you a given machine. Um, you know, you'll see all the assets on that particular machine. We do a page break, and you're on to the next machine. Uh, it's going to list out risks for that particular device, installed apps, listening ports, uh, literally anything we can grab on it, and then we go on to the next machine. Uh, pretty simple and straightforward. We have an Excel output, of course, search, sort, filter on charts and graphs, and that's the network assessment module. On security, we're doing a risk report just the same as on the network side. Um, risk score, plain English summary, charts and graphs. We have an external 
vulnerability report as well as an internal. Internally, we're doing egress, content accessibility, and a couple other things. Um, all these are available as samples online as well if you want to page through them uh, at your leisure. Uh, share permissions, we have two different kinds of share permissions, both on a user by user and then on a share by share basis. Um, so just to show you for a given machine, um, or I'm actually the users right now, so admin the administrator account has access to th uh, the print share on the engineer's machine. Um, read only though. So this will show you both the share permission and the NTFS permissions. Uh, we again do that on a share by share, so who has access to QuickBooks. Uh, we do an external vulnerability scan. Uh, and then we have kind of a login behavior as well. So this is going to show you on a per IP basis uh, all the open listening ports and then the security threats. Again, this was running from our servers, so it's very simple and easy to, to do. Uh, and then the login behaviors. So this is something that um, I think the user behavior analysis is probably the coolest of these. It's something that on the computer one, you could see, for example, the CEO's laptop who's trying to get into it. Um, but this is something that uh, for a given user, uh, maybe a little more telling. So, you know, it looks like Jay Costello tried to get into Costello SG uh, six times successfully, zero times unsuccessfully. Uh, but this is something that you can see that, um, you know, did try and uh, remote into it and was unsuccessful a lot of the time. So this is something you could find a user trying to get into uh, things they shouldn't. Um, maybe it's a service account that's expired uh, that you need to update the credentials on. Um, but what's really cool, again, is that um, you know, you're able to pull this data all together easily. And you know, if you were looking through this in the logs, um, you know, there are thousands of entries between what I, well, maybe 1,200 or 1,500 entries between what I have. And you know, that's a lot of data to sort through uh, just to find out what's going on. So it looks like M. Pullman, for example, has been accessing all these computers. Uh, but it looks like very unsuccessful in getting into a box called Rex. Um, so different data, and again, um, things you can present to your customer and find a lot of projects from. On the exchange side, we're doing traffic and use. So this is going to be you know, mailbox sizes, um, percentages. It's kind of a quota retention policy, sort of a report. Uh, distribution lists, going through all the distro lists in the environment and who's got access to them. Uh, mailbox detail, this is something if you're doing a migration, you'd of course need to Make sure you get all the settings correct for all the mailboxes, so it's great to just kind of know what's there and what to expect. It's something that we do permissions both by user and by mailbox, so this is kind of delegate access. Um, so for the administrator mailbox, these different users and uh, levels of accounts have these access rights. And then we have a mobile device report. So this is going to show you who's synchronizing what device, what operating systems, kind of what's going on. Um, if they don't have a bring your own device policy, Maybe a good opportunity to set up a policy. Um, MDM solution, a lot of things you can propose from that. Uh, and then we have a couple different things on the inform level. So we have the template, which is the blank. Um, you answer the questions in it, and then it generates a response report. So it's going to have pictures and details and different things you collected. Uh, a lot of opportunities from that. And then a SWOT analysis. So as you're bringing things in, you're categorizing them as a strength, weakness, opportunity, or threat. And that's going to build out uh, this sort of a table automatically. and uh, information on the, the different um, opportunities in the environment. So those are our reports. Um, again, you're welcome to page through them off of our website. We have them all up there. Um, but kind of back to the demo, uh, there's a lot of different things that you can do from these reports. Um, the goal is obviously to, for your existing customers or prospects, find opportunities, make money, and um, especially with prospecting, um, there's things that we call door openers. So could be old users or computers in Active Directory. It's kind of a sign of a mismanaged network. Um, it's a great project for kind of a user audit or AD cleanup. Uh, it's definitely something that comes with managed services, though. So if they have a managed service provider today, not really doing a good job, and definitely an opportunity to sell against that. Obsolescence. So in our Excel output, you'll see a list of all of the computers. And you can, of course, do some sorting to get different metrics. but um, you may notice a lot of old hardware, which is going to run things slowly. It's going to be incompatible with new applications and things that uh, the organization may want to do. Um, as far as the operating system, maybe they have a lot of XP machines, and those are no longer going to be updated as of April of 2014. So it could be an XP migration, a hardware refresh, uh, a lot of different opportunities that come from that. And of course, with the hardware side, 
um, some very generous reseller opportunities from, from margins you make. Single domain controller is a single point of failure. Uh, for a small business, uh, may just need a little redundancy through you know, off-site backups, or maybe it's a, a tolerable risk, but definitely something to suggest to a mid-sized organization, maybe even some small organizations, depending on what they do. Um, you know, they may not have a disaster recovery plan, or they may not be fulfilling it, so it could be a project to create one of those for IT as well. User groups permissions um, could be flat user groups, so everybody's an administrator, uh, obviously like a network lockdown or um, sort of a user cleanup uh, would be needed. Weak local passwords, um, it's a risk. Users, um, you know, localhost slash admin, localhost slash guest um, need to have good passwords too. Password to policy uh, setup. Insecure protocols um, could be users setting up a VNC to get in from the outside when they should be using the VPN. Um, could be people running their own FTP server, just a lot of different things. And it's a security risk, so a security audit could be appropriate depending on what else you find. Missing patches uh, goes out saying, I think users understand machines need to be patched. And it's something that it's part of managed services, but they may not have a WSUS server. Uh, they may not have RMM that's doing everything. So great to uh, sell patch management there. Antivirus and anti-spyware, same sort of a thing. You want to standardize them. You want to make sure everybody's running the same. You want to make sure they're all protected. Users understand um, antivirus is needed. Outbound port protocol access, uh, managed firewall solution. People shouldn't be able to get out on anything and everything. Should be locked down to some degree. Content filtering, um, something people can get out to social media, entertainment, pornographic, illegal downloads. Could be lawsuits waiting to happen, loss of productivity. Uh, great for a managed firewall solution or content filtering service. Share permissions. Um, again, you may find everybody has access to the QuickBooks share or everybody has access to everything. Uh, it's great to do a rights assessment uh, in addition to other things. External vulnerabilities. Um, you could find that people can get in from the outside. It's a risk to the network. Things could break. Uh, people could steal your data, um, you know, kind of mess with your network and uh, managed firewall solution, uh, ongoing managed security service. So once a quarter, you know, doing a regular assessment, keeping things current, reconfiguring their firewall, a lot of different projects you could get from that. Uh, and last but not least, um, if people are using their own devices, uh, it's something if they were losing it, um, could be a, a loss of business data or a data breach. So mobile device management, uh, mobile device policy, or uh, again, if you notice a lot of people syncing their own stuff, you could upsell the Citrix or SharePoint if they don't already have it, since people are kind of self-qualifying, saying, I want to do more when I'm outside the office. So again, ton of projects, ton of things you can do from these reports. Uh, it's kind of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, your mileage is going to vary from site to site, and you may find you know, double or triple this. You may find half of this. Uh, but in total, you know, we only covered a few door openers, but a, a lot of things you can do. So, uh, yeah, turn very nice stuff, over. Dave. Turn it back over to Mark. Okay. So Network Detective is comprised of three separate modules, as you saw from David. There's the Network Module, the Security Module, the Exchange Module. Um, as you saw, there are a number of distinct reports in each of the modules. Um, and in the Network Assessment Module, these things, you know, the reports cover a wide array of things, um, everything from the client risk, which is your executive summary, to the full assessment report and the Excel output which is really uh, kind of the meat and potatoes, as well as the other reports in this module. Um, it's everything you need to scope a contract, um, and potentially all these are client-facing. The Security Assessment Module contains its own set of reports. Um, it plays very nicely with the Network Assessment Module, provides more ammo for your prospecting and selling, um, terrific set of reports, and also this would be the kind of the deliverable, what you would do if you were doing a managed security service as well. And let me point out, all of these um, reports, the sample reports, are available on our website. Um, and we can shoot you that link, or I mean, you know, they're up on the website for you to take a look at. You know, again, the exchange assessment, a number of reports there, great for migrations, um, ongoing documentation.